What up, Corner Crew? Welcome to another episode of the Hip Hop Happy Hour Podcast. I am your host, as always, Brad Bailey. Welcome, welcome. Just want to give a shout out to everybody. You know how much we appreciate y'all for tuning in, for being with us, for being members. Click the link, go to YouTube, you know what to do. Without further ado, I want to bring on our guest this evening, a uh, very touted artist that does a lot of good for hip hop, and I wanted him to tell it. So let's bring him on. Scribe to God. Yo, Mike's on mute, brother. Peace, 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 peace. What's up? Right, bro. Up. Welcome, hip welcome, hop, welcome happy to the hip hop happy hour podcast. All right, blessings. How are, how are you, sir? How are you? I'm blessed. Always blessed. Right, you right. know, highly favored. Giving thanks. I want to. Uh, I want to start this off like we usually do. And my first question is for the people that don't know you. Tell us who Scribe the God is. Well, Scribe the God is a husband and father first. Um, I have a beautiful wife and five kids. Um, I am a, actually, I'm a servant of the Most High first, husband and father second, 1B. Um, I am an artist and conduit of love energy through the art forms of hip hop and uh, roots reggae, but hip hop is the foundation. I'm also an educator, um, certified a school administrator, a high school teacher. I teach hip hop in uh, Rochester City School District, as well as African studies and world history. I am also um, a, a cannabis entrepreneur as well. I'm a okay. owner and equity shareholder and uh, strategic planner and um, partner in multiple cannabis companies here in New York State, um, Six Point Cannabis. There you go, if you're in New York. Yeah, you know where to go. And, and Chrome Grown. Nice, nice. There you go. Uh, so th those things, um, as well as just the overall like revolutionary spirit for righteousness and justice. You know what I'm saying? So it's all, it's all. Oh, also, I'm our author, published author. I got a book around here somewhere, uh, but it's uh, doing in best class ever, doing and being hip hop in schools. How did it come about teaching hip hop in schools? So um, I've been an educator for 18 years, 16 of them with the Rochester City School District. Um, so for many of those years, I compartmentalized my life, uh, kind of like didn't let the left hand know what the right hand was doing right. when it came to hip hop and uh, education. And uh, I ended up having to transfer schools and I landed at a school that had the autonomy and the power to ask the kids what it is that they wanted to learn. And in doing so, that, that's an educational theory called uh, consequential learning. So in doing so, the, the kids elected to learn about hip hop. So then a professor from the U of R um, started designing the uh, class and I ended up showing up just in time. Um, and I ended up uh, partnering with the, with the class and then taking it over and being the primary lead educator for that. Um, and out of that came a book about the class because it was a university uh, city school district partnership mm -hmm. that was called the um, EPO at East High in Rochester. Um, shout out to my people at East, Joanne Larson and Eleni Dernay, who are the co-authors. And uh, so we took that four or five years worth of data and compiled it into a book about how the teaching of hip hop in schools as a content area, not as a mechanism for teaching traditional core um, requirements or whatnot is a way to restore strength, legacy, and uh, kind of like give power to the disenfranchised groups that hip hop came from. So it's, it's pretty, it's pretty heady stuff, man. Yeah, it, sound, it sounds, it sounds, I wish I had a hip hop class when I was in school. We had, we still were pump up, pumping out the recorder, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But tell us about your music career, because you do have a very interesting music career. Yeah, so um, I, you know, I used to be, I used to run the, run around the country, um, like following like Grateful Dead and Fish and stuff for many years. And then I had to sit down for a minute. And in that process, I just started writing. Um, so I came home and uh, just started to pursue music as an alternate for, you know, 
a lot of the other stuff I was doing. Ended up linking up with my brother, uh, DJ Two Way, and uh, recorded some stuff. And we formed a group called Level Seven. So we did that for years around Rochester. And I also, um, at the same time, uh, played with the band and kind of like was in the first stages of a band called the Giant Panda Gorilla Dub Squad, which is a roots reggae band out of Rochester. So I had both of those things going. And then, you know, I stopped playing full time with the reggae band. So I really just locked in on hip hop. You know, I don't really have the personality to uh, like wait for anyone else or like do a socialization piece to try to like make friends to get the beats and make the connections all that. So I just slowly acquired the equipment and taught myself how to do everything. Right. Um, it comes to recording, mixing and mastering and album art stuff. And I just started creating. And um, so yeah, the, uh, the everything that you see that's uh, on uh, SoundCloud or Apple Music, Spotify, all that, that's all recorded, mixed, mastered by me. I did the art for all that. It's just like all like self-made. The beats are collected from different producers for different albums. And uh, the mixtapes are a com compilation of producers. So uh did all that, was doing it. And then I realized because I make such dense music that I need to give the listeners, because I didn't really, I, I was more of a performer than a recording artist. Right. Just like when if you were to uh, add it all up. So I started putting cover songs in my sets to like keep the crowd engaged and like give their ears and their their process, their CPU a little rest time between like, you know, the light coated bars that I had. So from that, my brother E-Man from a band called Sophista Funk, and he had a project called Skunk City, which was a tribute band that was doing stuff like James Brown, Prince, Bob Marley. So he's like, yo, we got to do a Biggie tribute. So then we started the Frank White Experience. So I got level seven. I had level seven experience, which was a, a live band. And then the Frank White experience and also played the 10 piece reggae band called the Medicinals and Giant Panda. So yeah, pretty, pretty active with the, with the music vibes. Right now with the Frank White experience, how, how is it carrying Biggie's legacy? How's it, look? how is it carrying like Biggie? You have to, you, know, you have to carry that mm -hmm. presence and a lot of people, probably look at that and be like, oh, this dude's up there just doing Biggie tracks. So you, you have to kind of like carry that. Right. So um, what's interesting about it is that like I am a a master of ceremony, like I'm a 10,000 hours like MC, you know what I'm saying? So um, I have my own fingerprint on anything that I do, kind of like if you see Denzel Washington in the movie, hmm. he's always Denzel, even though right. he's a character. Right. So the thing that made it work off the rip and it also still makes it work is that it's not mimicry or it's not like a cover band. You know what I'm saying? Like it is a tribute and the songs that require channeling more of a, like a more of a like biggie voice and aesthetic things like maybe one more chance or juicy right. um, stuff like that. You know, I actually get into my like biggie vibe, you know what I'm saying? But other songs that are, just have more like uh, harmonic or melodic space and or like, you know, expressiveness, then I slide into more of like a scribe oriented performance style. So because when you're coming to see this, you're experiencing like versions that are more akin to like the scribe aesthetic and MC style and also versions that are more closer to like, you know, Biggs, you know, vocal tone and his cadence and the um, pentameter and all that, you get something that's authentic, you know what I'm saying? And then with that, we make sure that when we're doing what we do, we're also clarifying, you know, the fact that this is like, a peer, this, this is a period piece. This is no different than watching, you know, a World War II movie or something like that. So we get rid of like what would be the cancel culture with those pieces. And then we also um, give backstories to how being my bitch is a love song and how machine gun funk isn't about gun violence. It's about like using the mic to be as an alternative, you know what I'm saying? Which is the foundation of hip hop, you know, um, stopping gang violence in the Bronx and, and throughout the five boroughs through unifying and expressing ourselves in a competitive match matter through hip hop music. So 
we're carrying a legacy by, of course, keeping Biggie's music playing, like in the world, not just on the radio and in the digital space, and also by um, kind of spreading the message that we think a 50-year-old Biggie would do, you know, um, which is uh, probably have a little bit more cognizance and uh, sen sensitivity to the times and, and the evolution that's happened in our culture and society since then, you know, so those elements mixed in and very nuanced and tied in with the overarching like duty to be dope. You know what I'm saying? Like if you're going to have the audacity to, right. to, you know, then you got to do it well, you know? So yeah, exactly. our, band is, our band is comprised of pre-existing like pro musicians. You know, everyone has had other bands, side projects. Everyone's been doing this for, you know, 10, 15 plus years and different avenues. So, everyone's like a, a straight like assassin and you know we do it and we do it well um with intention you know not like it, it's not fluke or happenstance that you know it pops the way it does like we're very very um focused and intentional about like what we're doing how we're doing it and what it means you know what i'm saying so i think that's the recipe that has allowed us to um, always receive like positive feedback and acceptance and open arms from whoever um, experiences it from the diehard fans to Biggie's best friend, like Lil C's and the estate and his former manager and all that. Like it's been all love the whole time. So uh, the formula is working and if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Just right. the gas. Exactly. 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 Cause it, it could be totally misconstrued and yeah. yeah cancel call you just had a cancel culture and the way things are nowadays mm -hmm. it's like you have to do it the right way yeah and yeah really in everything in media and what i do in promoting shows and we try to do things the right way because one false move everybody's watching yeah you know it like the world we grew up in you know in the 90s oh, like, it's gone. yeah that's gone. Yeah, like, you know we live in a surveillance state. We live yeah. where your tweets from five years ago will be dug up on you. You know, we live in a, in a time where, like, there ain't no slipping, you know. So um, we know the space of time continuum, where we are in it, and uh, what we're here to do as a mission. So um, we just put all those elements together and and, and do it. And, now, and coming, it coming up coming up in the 90s, who were, like, your biggest influences? Because you're, you're a very thoughtful person. I can see that. And so... Who who really influenced Scribe? So I'm a I'm a child hip hop man. My mother started taking me to concerts when I was a, a little kid. Like I seen Michael Jackson and the Jackson Five when I was like six years old, you know, seven years old. And I used I see like all the Run DMC, LL Cool J, Houdini, like all that stuff coming up through the '80s. So I always had a like relationship with live music, and then. Um, and those things were playing as soundtracks of my life. My mother was young. And then when I got into listening to music myself, um, you know, it started in the, like, um, you know, it started like old school music. And then as the nineties came in, you know, like without having, living in Rochester, without having like a, a strong, like live scene in the streets, I was like already up on it. like. I was up on Tupac and Tupacalypse now, you know what I'm saying? Like right. I was, you know, listening to Protection Neck and Method Man before 36 Chambers came out, you know. But before those things, it was like LL, you know, stuff like that. So it's been hip hop the whole time. Um, but as I grew into like a teenage brain where I could really process uh, the music and, and its content, um, it was like, I'm a son of Shaolin, you know what I'm saying? I'm a Wu-Tang child. Um, and that's why like, I'm fearless when it comes to like the density of the content and and how it's kind of like a lotus pe petal flower that like grows with you. Mm -hmm. You can listen to it at 20, 30, 40, 50 and hear all the old stuff and still get new stuff as yeah. you develop in your capacity. Um, but yeah, Nas, you know, Wu-Tang, Big when he dropped, um, Gangstar, you know what I'm saying? Eric B. Rock him, all the foundational vibes, KRS one. And then um as it evolved, I just like went with it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Um all the way up until like through the raucous era, you know what I'm saying? All of the, the lyricism from all those things, underground stuff, 
all the way up to MF Doom, who's like my favorite MC, you know. Right. Um, at the same time, I listened to a lot of rock and roll. Like I said, I spent years on tour following jam bands around. Hmm. So the music sensibility is holistic when it comes to that, you know, the influences on how to like rock a show don't just come from the hip hop aesthetic. Right. right. I'm saying, which is another the front piece. man is a big thing. The front man is a big thing. So you know, and, and that's multi genre, you know, so mm-hmm. you could pull a uh, front man vibes from everything from James Brown to Mick Jagger, you know, right. to Fela Kuti, you know, like you can study all of those elements and then, you know, you know, into those little nuances, you know, as long as it's through your truth, you know what I'm saying? So, and that's something that I'm still developing um, as an artist. And it's all still developing, but those things are the things that are like most exciting right now. Like, how do you like really pro front man, and how do you like really like do, do that thing instead of just like making the music dope? Like, how do you make the performance dope? Right. You know, a lot of a so, lot of MCs don't think about that. A lot. Yeah. Of, I, I know it's like going to a lot of show uh, local shows. A lot of the local kids they don't think yeah. about their presence on, on stage. They're just up there rapping. Well, especially nowadays in the uh, digital culture, you know, kids don't even like everyone can buy a computer. Like we used to have to like find a studio, you know, yeah. um, I'm from the days of the ADAT, you know, these kids are from DAT PIF, live mixtapes or right. YouTube, you know, so they can make a song and have it come out decent in quality and then get a phone and stand on the couch in the living room and make a video and edit it up and go straight to the Internet, you know, so they don't they're not forced to get on stage in front of people until they actually start the bubble and pop. And that's why you see that, that skill lagging. Whereas like, I'm from where you had to start in a cipher on the sidewalk, you know what I'm saying? So you had to, that was the first thing you had to learn how to do, you know what I'm saying? Like make it come off, you know? So um, that is a big element with modern hip hop. I see, I, like I said, I teach the class and that's the biggest thing I have to teach the kids who want to rap. You know, we do like a, um, a showcase every year with school wide assembly and I gotta like really work these kids on how to like move across stage and like you know do it just uh, just enough to carry carry a tune you know so that's pretty dope yeah you do it once a year yeah once a year so the class is a semester class so we do uh a one and two like hip hop one hip hop two yeah and uh, at the end of the year we normally do like a school wide assembly Whoever wants to dance, rap, do some graffiti art, you know, spin on the controller or whatever. And then the kids who aren't necessarily performative are on the shyer side, they do like crew. Right. You know, right. Run, run the lights and all that stuff. So it's pretty, it's pretty dope. Uh that's that's the best part of it all, just to see these kids like work towards something that they might have always had interest in, but never really had a a mechanism to like explore that interest you know and you just see them light up and you see people go through like insecurities to confidence and having like zero skill to like actually pulling something off you know right. so, okay, yeah. I, I wish i had that. i wish i had that class when i was in school i really do we, we, well you we, can check it out by the, totally reading, different people. the book's only 112 pages and like 20 of them are like references it's a quick read um and it talks about like the philosophy of like having to be like have a loving heart to be a successful teacher anyways and how through that we've developed this class and it's about giving the kids like i said the opportunity to to like mine from the culture that exists at large internal intrinsic motivation and and, and identity right a lot of those things that are taken away by you know 400 years of you know oppression you know the whole like slavery thing and and you know i've been teaching history for a while and i always had to go back to like the ancient world right. to find things to like restore legacy and then this development and this is right now you know i, got, I don't have to talk about egypt or you know hannibal or you know the, the king of nubia and all those other things right. that are not as relevant and applicable to someone who is in the aesthetic of like learning and being programmed through their ears from the music that they're taking in, you know? So yeah, it's, it's, it's been a pretty dope ride, man. Yeah, it's good, good on you, man. Good on you. Exactly. Those kids appreciate it. 
Yeah, yeah. I want to flip it back to your music career and uh, yeah. the Frank Light experience you've taught around. You've mm -hmm. been around, you've played with a lot of people. Um, who was your biggest pleasure to work with, Tori? I mean, so uh, shout out to Lil C, Cesar Leo, man. Like, that's my brother, bro. He's got such a vibe. And um, ever since we first encountered C's, it's just been all love and support. Like, that's actually our, our brother. And just to be with, who was biggest, closest friend, who was on stage, like, for everything. Um, and to have him be like, this is the vibe, this is the place that I want to be. And just, like, having that energy and, like, being on stage, looking over and sees doing my ad libs and stuff like that, or doing the ad libs. Right. And, like, the, the um, uh, what, what it's called, the, uh, like, the, what is the voiceover tracks or, you know, that stuff is just, it's pretty surreal. You know? um, that that's just been like wow. And then doing Biggie's 50th birthday gala was also quite the experience, uh, sharing the stage with um, Smith and Wesson and you know um, Lil Kim, people like that. It's just like a really dope vibe. Besides that, man, it's all about Rochester. You know, Scribe the God is the Rochester institution. My brother Hassan Mackey is the illest MC on the planet. You know what I'm saying? And um, you know, he has records. Check out Daily Bread. Check out That Grit. Um, Hassan Mackey, H-A-S-S-A-A-N-M-A-C-K-E-Y. And just having to, like, be his brother, like, has always put like, pushed me to have to, like, really, really leave it on the stage. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We'd go before or after him because we would do, like, a flip a coin type vibe. Um, it, it sharpens, you know, man sharpened man, you know, so when it comes to like my favorite person to be on stage, that's my brother Hassan. Um, but some of the most surreal and remarkable moments have been the four, the four mentioned. Right. Now coming up in Rochester, being away from the city, what was life like trying to get into hip hop? Well, that's the thing. Like I didn't take that traditional path. Um, a lot of people from this town like had to move down to New York mm. and like and try to enter into that underground scene. And, and I had experience, shouts out to my boys, Jersey Roots, my boy Dom and Darian. Um, also, I gotta shout out my brother James from Giant Panda because I did. We did a lot of work traveling the country um, with Panda doing the reggae vibes, and I would do guest verses and whatnot. Um, and they just dropped an album, Loving Time. Check that out. I gotta join on there with them. But um, being from Rochester, like I took like the live music route, and we built our constituency from our like regional radius, you know, the Buffalo, right. Rochester, Syracuse, Ithaca area of central and western New York. I never really worried about um getting down to the city and, and competing in that um hierarchy of you know the rap reality down there. Mm. Um, I've done some shows down there and whatnot, but we really just built the grassroots, you know what I'm saying? And uh created our 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 mark and our our just like our fingerprint or impression on the the scene through being those dudes from the town that always just put it down, you know, and just spreading that out, like I said, on along the I-90 and, and the Southern Tier. And, um, and that's what's been so dope about it. And we just been following that same algorithm and just, go, you know, going further and further with the Frank White. And because it comes off the way it does, like everywhere we go, it's like a new new spot on the map, like in GTA, like the map just gets bigger and bigger, you know? So, um, yeah, it's a real organic and like, you know, analog based formula in a digital world, but you know, it's real, you know, like having 10,000 followers doesn't mean that you have 10,000 fans, right? like listeners, you know, you can put something out on the platform and have 10,000 followers and get a hundred clicks, you know, like, but if you have 500 people in a room and then yeah. you have 100 people in a room, like you're going to get a higher percentage of actual people that like you tap into, you know? So, um, and that's how we like circumnavigated having to like tap into New York city or the five boroughs and, uh, and just, but we've been able to do that with this band. Um, like I said, everywhere we go with this, it just, it works, you know? So, right. Yeah, it's kind of liberating to not have to like, you know, do the pecking order thing, you know, and just like 
you know, be a, be a pro and then do pro shit and then come out and just, like Kendrick said, they would pull up, pop out, air out, make it look sexy, you know? Right. Yeah, you're right, because it is a, there's such a competition. Like, we, we talk about that on this show a lot, is like how how much content drops weekly. Like, it's, it's mind-blowing. There's no way to keep up. No one can hear everything. There, I mean, there are a couple of people out there that really do try to listen to every new thing that comes out. But it's like there's really how do, how do you keep up in that world? Yeah, and and like it's really you have to have a play or some kind of rules that you're running. You know, you have to manipulate the system in some kind of way. Um, and whether you do that through a local following or through a digital following, you have to like package it and have like a, a strategic plan on like what's going to make your content cut through. Right. Um, it, it's really difficult and that's why i'm sitting on um I'm, i got multiple albums of unreleased like scribe to god music that i'm just like no the platform isn't like the foundation isn't like solid enough under my feet to like just put this music out to put it out you know it's, 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 I, it's, I feel like it's too good to just like put it on you know uh distro what's it uh cd baby or something like that and get and get it on you know, the digital streaming sites and then like using my existing social media platforms. And, you know, it's not like the social media networks are like they used to be like, you got to pay for, you got to pay for the algorithms to actually put in the work, you know? So um, I've sent out a bunch of original music and we're building this platform to of course, you know, expand upon the, the other things that we got in the stove and in the oven. So, you know, we're, we're Trojan horse in it with this but at the same time, like enjoying every moment and being true true to what we're doing, you know? So. That's dope, that's dope. At least you like what you're doing, you love what you're doing, because a lot of artists out there are just pumping out material yeah. just to stay relevant and stay on people's name, on lips, and so that's good on you. Um, yeah. I, we got a little segment around here I like to call What's Your Issue? Okay. Now, we're gonna roll into What's Your Issue? So, I mean, it's kind of self-explanatory, but it could be something very small that just your pet peeve or one of your big worldly issues of the day. But, Scribe, what's your issue? Uh, my issue is the perpetual, um, like, inability for America to reconcile its cardinal sin. Hmm. Um, it's difficult to, to be an artist, to be a free-spirited individual and have to navigate a nation that has this like such a profuse like blemish on its record and then also be a descendant of people on both sides of my family that were victims of that so balancing like my nature as a conduit of like love energy and then also having like to fight the war against um ignorance and you know evil um and people not having the necessity of tapping into like self-reflection and just like your genetic and ancestral legacy and how that has impacted like your ability to sustain your life and others inability to do so um so that's a theme that i'm burdened with through all the avenues in which i um serve through, whether it's education art you know cannabis music you you know it's it's all oriented and fighting that fight so my issue is you know the white supremacist myth and the institutional downpression that has been you know systematically and effectively like you know rendered on on, on the people that's that's an issue that's your yeah issue. it's the it's the issue you it know? is the issue it is the issue and it, it, it's, I don't see it, I don't personally see it the way you see it because I can't. Yeah. We, we didn't live the same life. Right. And so I've never seen it as a race issue personally. I've seen it as a class issue. Yeah. Well, the thing is like race, the classism is the ism. It, exactly. exactly. But racism is the mechanism to maintain the larger ism. Right. So, you know, part of the privilege of your genetic reality is that, you know, like you would have to 
your being good hearted will lead you to see class before race mm-hmm. because you wouldn't necessarily be using race in a conscientious way to, you know, make choices on how you treated the people that you met, you know. So exactly, exactly. You would have, I don't use it as in my day to day life. Yeah, I don't yeah. Use it. yeah, you know, but but at the same time, like you're you, you can't be seen as something other than what you're not. You know, like the difference between um other progressive issues like uh gender or um religion, whatever it may be, is that those things are choices to disclose. Right. You know what I'm saying? Like you have to disclose the fact that you're gender fluid or you have to dis- disclose the fact that you might be you know jewish or something else you know whereas race like you can't like there's no, there's no hiding it yep right you know so um and that's why it's kind of like come on like what are we doing like we have to we have to get this thing you know we gotta get this thing like at the front of all of those progressive pieces like it's not to me it's it's very very diabolical and strategic that there's only a race card you know what i'm mm-hmm. saying like you don't get told you're playing the gender card or you're playing the religious card you get respected in your rights get enfranchised but if i'm talking about the grievances related to race you know because people don't want to do the self-reflective piece and and the you know the the orientating of themselves in order to actually like become a co-conspirator and an active participant in fighting against that um because of whatever guilt or you know just like unwillingness to you know tap in you know that gets to be a, a very frustrating piece because good people won't swing that far you know because they don't want to they don't want to bring in to their consciousness like a heavy burden, you know, and responsibility that it is to know that like you intrinsically benefit whether you intend tend to ever and you know I'm intrinsically, you know, at disadvantaged regardless of how articulate or brilliant or exceptional I am, you know, like and I always say like to my wife, shout out to Nine Minutary, um, that being black's like having the flu and being white's like having cancer. You know what I'm saying? Like you could have cancer and have no idea. Right. You know, so racism to white people is like a cancer, to black people it's like the flu. Like you know you have the flu. Mm. You know, like there's no question the like, symptom the symptoms are <laughs> like they're there, you know, with with you know on the other side of the, the proverbial tracks, like you might not never get diagnosed. You know, you might never even know that this thing is festering and growing as a part of your consciousness and that it's stopping you from being able to like serve for the betterment, you know? So um, it's difficult uh, creating art and and perpetuating a narrative that like moves both sides, you know, moves this side towards liberation and moves this side towards reconciliation, you know? So it is the American uh, paradox. It is, you're absolutely right. And it's hard, it's hard to live in America and and watch it happen, watch it unfold and see that how blind people are through social media, through mainstream news. And because like, I, I can actually, I think for myself, like that's kind of rare nowadays. You know, if you don't follow the crowd, cancel culture, here we come again, because yeah. everything has to be in an order. Everything has to have a label. Yeah. Well, well, that in itself is a su- mechanism of a white supremacy system to try to keep other progressive issues in front of the truth and reconciliation issue of race and like reparations and all that. Like, there's no cancel culture. There's very little cancel culture for racism, but they put all of these like super profuse and like intense cancelable pieces on things like religion and gender, you know, yeah. and um, progression for any group in this country has always yeah. been yeah. Um, made easier and accessible from the struggles of black people to make America live up to its creed, you know, so it, it's very, very, um, I, I, I kind of want to say convoluting and, and disheartening to like, it's so obvious that these are the people on the front that are taking all of the <laughs> 
the live fire in yeah. in the media and then you know all the society all the other pieces like everyone else's difference gets pushed to the front and acknowledged and if it's going to be equality for that then it has to be for everyone you know like you can't pick and choose and and that's what the government and society does they pick and choose or we're programmed and through the norms and the narratives to, you know what I'm saying? Like be forced to, you know, uh, like give people their pronoun choice over, you know, identifying the fact that like, there's a discrepancy in, you know, uh, language acquisition and um, wealth, uh, the generational wealth building and, you know, things like, like real estate and just like, these other cultural elements that are systematically at play. And uh, that doesn't give, that doesn't get the same, that, that struggle doesn't even get the same respect and the same accountability metrics put in place to be, you know, neutralized. You know, it's just, I don't know one wants to hear about that anymore. You know, look, look at that, look at this, you know, it's all. Same thing with, same with mainstream media. A couple of weeks ago, all the stuff that's happening in the country, the Ohio train ball, UFOs, the UFOs are in the sky. We're shooting yeah. UFOs. They wanted you to focus on those damn UFOs rather than anything else going on in the world. So it's wild. It's crazy. Yeah. But I want to flip it. We got we got real serious here. I want to flip it. And I want to, uh, we have another little segment here we like to call Tales, Tales from the Road. So Tales. Okay, Tales from the Road. You've been on tour. You've been on tour a very long time, I'm sure. Yeah. What what is your wildest story from the road? Hmm. As a performer? Yes, sir. Uh, well, you know, because I, because well because I have a long, extensive performing career. Um, the road's almost kind of the most, like, I don't want to say tamed, but it's kind of the most like normal, like it's normal place because mm-hmm. you know I'm working. Yeah. Like first of all, so you know, uh, tales from the road is just like times in the bus. You know what I'm saying? Like, be like being in cannabis, being able to bring like the tour bag of herb, and like all my band members just being like in a candy store. You know, with all right. the different strands and and edibles and stuff, and just the camaraderie of just you know busting busting balls on the bus. You know what I'm saying? Building on on things like top five and. You know, what's your favorite, you know, just that camaraderie piece um, and the the humor that comes out of that, that builds the connectivity between the band players. That's really the 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 goal that no one gets to see. Like, you know, I always say people drive 10 minutes, 20 minutes from their house, come to a show and then drive 10 minutes back. We drive seven hours mm-hmm. to play a two hour show and then sometimes got to get back in the car. Right. and drive more so it's like we intentionally make the best out of that time because that's the place that we can actually like mine and make the meaning that we don't get to receive as the givers of the energy on stage you know mm-hmm. so just like you know like i said like the crack of the jokes and with the band members and you know coming like giving people nicknames and like busting their balls for stuff that might happen on the road. Like our bass player, we call him Nasty Mike um, because he's like single, you know, and, and promiscuous, you know, so like, you know, just like fucking with Nasty Mike or like being on stage and, you know, doing Nasty Boy by Biggie and they'd be like, you Nasty Mike, you Nasty, you know, and he comes out, that's like a bass solo or whatever. Right. And the ladies are wild, you know, and just so all of those little pieces and how we can, incorporate those things and those personality things into our stage performance that's when we're having the most fun you know like and my drummer being like such a virtuoso and just like a, a monster of a talent like singing rapping drumming our musical director you know getting him out there from behind a drum set and just like seeing him like crip walk across the stage when doing snoop and you know just like having fun like that um those are those are like the really the coolest things we keep a, we run a pretty tight ship like um you know we don't we we are rock stars but we don't do like prototypical rock star shit because we're all like big fathers and, yeah, exactly. and exactly. mothers and stuff like that so um it's just good clean fun man 
and then just like hitting that special space when the spirit and the voodoo and like all that is coalesces on the stage. I want to go back to camaraderie. Do you think that's something that's missing in hip hop now? Yeah, because like, um, like even with the like younger folks and like their crews, you know, whether it's like the acronym crews or uh, um, like record label or crews like that, like there's not a there, there's an entourage involved, mm -hmm. but the the amount of people that are like on the stage actually like doing the energy work a lot of times a lot smaller than when you tour with a like live instrumentation act you know yeah. so not necessarily sh sharing the stage and that focal point with a larger group of people and then also with live music there is that magic thing that happens from a music standpoint where you're actually like like I said, it's like music is a voodoo or voodoo like practice, you know what I'm saying? Like like Jimmy Hendrix said, voodoo child, you know? And like being a part of that in a ceremonial, like with a, a full instrumental, like entourage, like you can bring that spirit in with like a lot greater efficiency than you can with two turntables and mic. Mm. You know, when, when I used to have to do two turntables in the mic sets, it's really just all on you to like right. tap into that thing and then let it pour through you. And then people are like, oh, wow, you know, like there it is. There's that awe inspiring thing. But the the band playing in unison and in harmony, like it's awe inspiring, like on its own. And then like you do dope music in a dope way with that, you know, concert in concert in accord with each other. It's it's a whole different vibe, you know. So I think it is missing in hip hop and not having hip hop be as regional as it used to be, and the aesthetics be as like localized when it comes to like, you know, how it used to be in New York in the early days and then nineties, or like in Atlanta when that when they were coming up, or maybe even like in Houston, it's like Houston with the whole rap a lot movement, or the Bay with hieroglyphics and all of that. Like, it very seldom nowadays do you have like a it was, I think the last people to really do that effective is like the ASAP mob. Yeah. You know what I'm like they really had that like crew posse like vibe and like presentation and the kids in New York were going crazy over that, you know, before it ever popped. Mm. Um, so I feel like to get the same thing that we're getting, you have to literally have a, a crew of talented individuals like ASAP mob did. You know what I'm saying? You can't have like one guy who's gonna, who is the one person that like pops and then like everyone else in your crew is just like still an underground artist or like a hype man, you know? And I think that's what Wayne like tried to do with Young Money or did with Young Money, you know? Just getting like more artists than him to be on the level. So when you go, like it's a, it's a movement, it's a, it's a vibe, it's an aesthetic, it's a, it's a, you know, it's signature. And I think that's the thing that's missing. Um, people don't really have that. They kind of like pop in these vacuums and they have their crew and all that, but it doesn't really translate into the the, the um, larger platform. Yeah, you know? exactly, exactly. Totally agree with you. Um, I got a question for you and it's something I usually ask. And what would be your holy grail of music making? Um, hmm. I know it's a tough one. We make, we make you think around here. I think that my holy grail of music making would be like having the the whatever the status or the respect of you know the creators of the world at large to be able to like truly you know have an album made like Illmatic was made you know what I'm saying like just being able to pick all of my heroes and you know those individuals that just like were Mount Rushmore level contributors uh to hip-hop or the producer and 
MC level and just being able to like have the budget and the the social connectivity to be able to like just call you know call up right. you know Method Man call up Rizzo for a beat Premier Dr Dre you know mm-hmm. the Jay Dilla State <laughs> Matt Lib you know what I'm saying Q Tip and get like verses from you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, everyone from Kara's with a rock him down to like Kendrick Lamar, you know, and uh just be able to like use all of that to, you know, create the texture and the and like the the soundscapes that would like, you know, help and enhance what I do intrinsically. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um that would be from a creative standpoint and from a like live like performance standpoint i just want to you know rock stadiums bro like just move as many people as possible every time you know with the music you know around the world like everywhere you know so that's one thing that's excited about doing this big thing is that it doesn't have a geographical limitation Mm. Um, and then that's what's cool about making music that is timeless is that you don't have to rush with like rolling it out and it also doesn't have a geographical locate uh, uh, limitation you know what i'm saying wu-tang is for the babies it's worldwide you know what i'm saying like yeah. biggies everywhere you know and so is like bob marley you know so you know the holy grail was be able to be on that level of a creative that the art that is coming through me as a conduit is having that impact in efficiency of delivery to the people of the world yeah it, re- it reaches every corner of this world too so it's you it's doable it definitely is doable yeah. you know i tell i tell that to some of my friends that when they're down about their spotify and their freaking band camp i'm like just it all takes that one song man one song will hit and that's all you could blow up and be from here to Australia, even though a lot of people are already listening in Australia. Yeah, like yeah. Germany, South Africa. Like, thing, like they're hungry. They're hungry for it, man. Like they want it. And it's just like, you know, people are, they have a false reality thinking that, you know, the internet only is like going to make that happen for you. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can do it. I'm not doubting the potential of internet and the like digital space and whatnot, but people are still people, you know, and even if they find you on the internet, like they're going to want to like tap into you on a humanity level and exactly. a human experience. And um, that's the, what's so wide of a gap between like, Oh yeah. You know, I could pay um, any social media platform to like, boost ads in any part of the world, you know, um, that doesn't mean that I'm going to actually be able to get to see the world and, and touch the, all the people, you know, that would be interested in the thing if you were actually going to those places, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? And there were promoters that had to, you know, make good on their guarantees by actually doing their job on the ground to get people who are you know, intrinsically interested in it to it to experience it. You know, there's no there's no skin in the game on the other side of an algorithm. Right. But if someone's bringing you to Germany to play music, then they're also, you know, putting their crying and their passion and their love of hip hop into making that happen for you on the ground in that place. You know. So like we experience that now with like talent buyers, and venue owners, but I think as you you know, expand and you start to think about a global reality, like the people who are buying that talent are a lot more closer to the love of the art and culture mm. than it might be in America, you know? Right. Um, the American reality is more like people have venues and they hustle their venue like a band hustles their music, you know, they got to have people in there to pay the bills, you know what I'm saying? So they're pulling from multi, multiple genres, you know? But if you're gonna go do a European tour, you're gonna go to Australia, they're gonna be more like like hip hop exclusive, oh, yeah, you definitely. know? 
they don't get yeah, it. They don't. They don't get it all the time over there. So it's like very, very nice for them when they have a world tour like uh, Nas and Wu are going over there. Yeah. You know, like that's, that's, gonna be, that's gonna be crazy. It's gonna be crazy, you know. And uh, it, I mean, it's even like even in America. Like when we, we we went to Colorado in December. We did four shows: one in Denver, one in Boulder, and two up in the mountains in Frisco. And like everybody was so grateful hmm. that there was like live hip hop, and especially like something that they had a sense memory and an intrinsic love for. Because a lot of times it might be hip hop, but it's like it's local, and you know, like pe- those those places people are bringing in you know, hip hop acts, especially like mid tier acts that people who love hip hop, hip hop might be, you know, like vibing with, you know, you might get a stop for, you know, a Nas, like I said, or Wu-Tang or something that stops in like Denver or something like that. But it's, you know, it's a lot less common for, you know, someone who's like in the current hip hop, like, you know, like kind of sewer space to be brought into those markets, you know, because it's difficult to make it make sense when it comes to getting there, you know, the promo. Uh, uh, all those yeah, it is. It is. The promoting side of it is tough too. We I actually, I put on shows last year for local venues out of Boston and it is, it's tough. It's tough trying to bring people in and no one wanted since COVID, everybody's got very comfortable being inside their house. No one wants to get up and do anything anymore. They're like, ah, we'll do that the next one, you know. So it's it's tough all around. It is. It really is. It really is. But we're gonna be uh wrapping up here soon. So I really appreciate you coming on. This has been very insightful, very thoughtful. Yeah, you actually pleasure. the way you speak about music is like you're almost painting it with a brush. Mm-hmm. Um so you're actually you're a very true artist and but we also like to shamelessly self promote around here. Of course. So you go for yours. Give us every link. Drop everything you're doing. Anything that you can tell us about. Not there's no shame. There's no shame in self promotion. All right. No. So it's Scribe to God. S K R I B E D A G O D. That's everywhere. Um, that's if you're going to a music streaming site. Um, if you're going to Google, uh, Scribe to God dot com. At Scribe to God on all social media platforms. Um, Frank White E X P dot com at frank white exp everywhere um also like i said six point cannabis get that way if you're in rochester go ahead okay. i wish lands i could come up there and just drive up there right now and grab some yep lands breath um lands breath is the the like umbrella uh corporation and company entity that we kind of are putting all of our work in cannabis education um our advocacy you know, through that as a cultural, like cornerstone, Six Point is the cannabis brand. We got the garbage plate, which is our uh, our self bread strand, which is one of cannabis cup here in New York. Chrome grown edibles, chrome grown. Um, uh, Shouts out to Elevated Express delivery service. Uh, Best class ever doing and being hip hop in schools. Um, It's published by Columbia University on Teachers College Press. You can get it on that website as well as Amazon and wherever you buy books. And um, shout out to my wife, Naima Nateri, Nateri's Naturals um, at Free Soul Dynamic, which is um, her and I work with her with like when it comes to like education and uh, curriculum, you know, uh, just like things that do with advocacy and activism. Um, Shouts out to Giant Pin, the Gorilla Dub Squad. Love and Time is out now. Um, there's a, a song on there featuring me. Those, those are my brothers. We've been doing music since 2003, uh, 2004. And shouts out to Hassan Mackey, uh, Low Budget, Frank White Experience, Skunk City, you know what I'm saying? And the whole Rochester Massive, you know, big ups. Again, thank you for coming on. Thank you for joining us on the Hip Hop Happy Hour. Big up, big up. We'll talk to you again soon, I'm sure. Yeah, man, keep anytime. Grinding, keep grinding, keep teaching, keep doing your thing. And yeah, shout out to Reef the Lost Cause. I know you're gonna put that um yep, yep, we got that track. Reef's actually coming on and Reef's gonna be doing our anniversary episode in April. Oh, so that's, that's, a little, that's a little spoiler right there. 
Yeah. But um, again, much respect to you, man. Thank you. You're a Thanks, true man. Honor, I appreciate it. We're gonna have you on again. Yeah, Great please time. do. Anything, man. Tap in, man. And you know, listen to the listen to the music, bro. And uh, I'll I'll send you some advance some some advance files for some unreleased vibes so you can catch a vibe that that forever for now it isn't out yet. Um, and I got a lot of stuff in the cooker, bro. I got like six or seven albums already. Oh, okay. You know, oh, so I bless you with some exclusive joints so you can, you know, premiere them and we'll just do some work, man. Let's, let's get to work. Definitely. Definitely. Keep grinding, my brother, and I will talk right. to you soon. What's up? Right. Everyone, hip-hop happy hour. We out. Peace.